Like a lot of kids, I loved watching trains. I liked hearing the trains blast their horns when I was in class, or even during recess, I'd go over to the playground and watch uh, trains go by. Uh, but that March, the Rock Island shut down, and uh, it was just kind of striking for a kid who liked railroads to suddenly not see the trains anymore and grass growing between the rails. And uh, that's really what started uh, uh, an interest of mine. And then I, uh, when I was in high school, uh, you had to write a research paper for 11th grade English class, and I decided to uh, dig into the Rock Island. And uh, that's the first time I uh, interviewed a former employee of the Rock Island. I just started working in radio at the time, and thankfully I had the foresight to record that interview, and it uh, is uh, one of, it was the first of now many interviews that I've been recording with uh, former employees of the railroad. I've talked with uh, about 30 uh, over the years, uh, spoken to a lot as I've prepared this book. But uh, I'll go ahead and uh, show you some photos here and tell you a little more uh, about the railroad. The Rock Island was uh, at one time one of the main railroads operating in the state. As you can see, it had a huge footprint. Uh, the main line was the uh, Little Rock, uh, Memphis, and then out west uh, stretch of the railroad. That was uh, part of uh, a line that ran all the way out to uh, Amarillo, Texas for passenger service and uh, Tucumcari, New Mexico. The part from uh, Little Rock to Memphis, that was actually part of what was the first chartered railroad in the state, the Little Rock and Memphis Railroad, which was uh, chartered just before the uh, Civil War. And uh, the, uh, there was a railroad called the Choctaw, Oklahoma and Gulf that uh, toward the end of the 1800s decided it wanted to link coal resources in Oklahoma with the Mississippi River and uh, they bought the Little Rock and Western and they completed the line uh, all the way to uh, Oklahoma and uh, that's where it started growing. It was uh, an impressive operation. They built what is today the uh, Clinton Presidential Park Bridge, uh, the bridge crossing the Arkansas River. That was built uh, between 1898 and 1899. They built the, uh, the depot there, the train station in Little Rock, that is now the uh, Clinton School of Public Service. And uh, the Rock Island was growing at that time. It was a Chicago-based railroad, and it was looking to expand. And it actually uh, acquired enough stock that uh, it ended up uh, doing a hostile takeover of the Choctaw, Oklahoma, and Gulf, taking control of it in 1902. And uh, by 1904, it uh, became official. And this was really at its height uh, when it, uh, a lot of these were branch lines. And uh, you can see it uh, uh, just went all over the state. It was never the biggest railroad. That was uh, the Missouri Pacific. Uh, Cotton Belt was also a very sizable operation. Uh, and the Cotton Belt, uh, and well, really, it was uh, the Missouri Pacific. That was the impressive railroad in the state. That sits a uh, uh, bridge right over there. The Missouri Pacific built that, and it was later acquired by the uh, Union Pacific. But uh, except for a few stretches, most of uh, the tracks you see here have been removed, uh, and it's part of the tragic history of the Rock Island uh, that I'll get to. But uh, during the... Uh, Glory days, it was an impressive train. This actually isn't uh, too far away from here. That's the third street overpass uh, that you see in the background here in Little Rock. Uh, that's where it, uh, the road transitions from third street into Markham. And uh, at that time, that's uh, uh, the Rock Island's uh, Choctaw Rocket. Uh, it's a streamlined train, used to run between uh, Memphis and Amarillo, Texas. From there, it uh, connected with the, uh, uh, the Southern Pacific, and then you could take it on into uh, Los Angeles. So this was part of a major transportation vein here in the U.S. This uh, photo was from uh, 1949. The uh, streamlined locomotives 
Uh, they first started running in 1940 in Arkansas. Uh, they replaced the uh, steam locomotives, and uh, it was with great fanfare that they uh, modernized trains before this. Of course, you had the uh, uh, steam locomotives, uh, but this was a great way to uh, travel. And uh, here is, uh, this was 1904. This is actually over in North Little Rock. This was uh, shortly after the Rock Island had uh, taken over the Choctaw, Oklahoma, and Gulf, and uh, they had all the uh, employees pose for this photo. And uh, I, I love this photo for a number of reasons. First off, it's interesting how you can tell the, uh, the status of the employees just by looking at their clothes. Uh, obviously, the people in the uh, clean suits and the white shirts are executives. Most of the rest of them covered in oil and grease. Uh, those were the uh, laborers. But uh, yeah, this was a great photo that I was able to get uh, for my book from uh, North Little Rock and uh, the North Little Rock History Commission. And uh, you can actually zoom in so tight uh, on this. Uh, one, another favorite thing of mine is uh, the guy there at the top. I'm wondering how he secured that incredible position to have his foot there on the, the headlight uh, for the train. So uh, it operated uh, for a number of years. Uh, this, is, uh, this one was uh, 1928. The, uh, this was over near uh, Brinkley. Uh, this was during a, a big flood that happened that year of the White River. Uh, Highway 70 was closed. Rail service was still Primarily how people got around, but uh, more and more people were starting to travel by car. And uh, at that time, with Highway 70 closed, uh, the Rock Island offered to uh, run what they called shuttle trains. And they actually uh, let people drive their cars uh, for a fee, obviously, uh, but onto uh, flat cars. And thanks to a lot of work by the uh, maintenance crews, they were able to keep the tracks from uh, becoming uh, flooded. And they operated uh, these uh, uh, shuttle trains. Uh, another impressive scene here, this is actually over the uh, Little Rock train station. Uh, this, uh, the one that is today the Clinton School of Public Service. This was toward the end of uh, uh, the uh, steam locomotives era uh, in Arkansas. And uh, it's uh, not long after this that the uh, uh, diesels came in. But the first person I, I interviewed in 1990 or 1988, his name was uh, L.T. Walker. He had been a brakeman and a conductor for the Rock Island, and uh, he actually started when they were still running steam locomotives. And uh, he told me the steam engines were fascinating, but by the time you got where you were going, you'd be uh, just covered in grease and grime, and the diesel engines were much cleaner. Uh, more powerful, uh, so, but fascinating to uh, uh, talk to him. I actually, when I did that interview in 1988, I thought I'd uh, sit down with him for maybe a half hour. I recorded it, but uh, this gentleman really loved to talk, and I ended up recording about uh, three hours, one train story after another, and at the time, you know, again, I, I'm a junior in high school, and you know, I almost just wanted to escape. But as I said, I recorded it, and uh, years later, I realized just how special that was. And that's what really sparked an interest for me in uh, recording oral histories with people who work for the Rock Island. The Rock Island shut down in 1980, and so it's now been 38 years since the Rock Island has been gone. Uh, but there's still a lot of uh, people around, and in recent years, especially as I uh, started working on this book, uh, I've been making an effort to uh, talk to more employees to document their stories while I uh, still can. Uh, but I'll uh, show you a little bit. The, the railroad really, uh, after World War II, it began a period of decline for railroads in general. And uh, not long after that, you had the uh, interstate highway system 
uh, being built during the Eisenhower years. Uh, that was federally subsidized, of course, and uh, uh, the railroads kind of took that as, well, you know, money, public money is going to this, and uh, it was one of many factors that uh, left uh, the railroad struggling. You also had uh, growth of uh, airline travel, and it really began a few decades of decline for uh, railroads in the U.S. By the time this photograph was taken, this was uh, 1960, the Rock Island had stopped running the streamlined full trains with uh, sleeper cars and diner cars, and uh, at this time they were running uh, the one car, uh, Bud Car is what it was called, uh, an RDC car. Some nicknamed it a doodle bug, uh, but, and it wasn't much more really than a bus on rails, but uh, it was still a, a, a profitable uh Mo pro profitable for the railroad, uh, in part because uh, they had a key contract with the U.S. government, uh, running mail, and you can see bringing a mail cart out there. And you probably recognize that this is the, uh, the Little Rock train station, what is today the Clinton School of Public Service. And uh, I'll talk a little about its uh, history uh, as well. Uh, it's another one of the uh, things that's just uh, amazing that it's uh, uh, still around, a great piece of history. A uh, few more, this uh, isn't too far away from here. This is actually uh, looking uh, down from uh, Cantrell, the uh, overpass uh, on Cantrell. This is uh, the Rock Island crosses this same track, the Missouri Pacific, or what used to be the Missouri Pacific track here, and uh, this is... Uh, where it uh, then curves and starts heading uh, west. Uh, this is the same track that if you uh, drive along Cantrell, it's uh, right there alongside Cantrell for a mile or two. Uh, and the road, this railroad crossing is uh, still here, but uh, great photo with the uh, state capitol in the background. Uh, another photo of the doodle bug, this was uh, the Brinkley train station where uh, you had uh, the Rock Island cross the Cotton Belt track. So it was actually a, a big depot that served uh, two railroads, but uh, another uh, great photo. And uh, as I said, the uh, mail contract was uh, key. That's what still, despite, despite the decline in passenger rail service uh, for the Rock Island and other railroads, they still had the uh, U.S. government uh, delivering mail. Uh, by trains, and it wasn't until that contract was canceled in 1967 that the Rock Island soon uh, filed with the Interstate Commerce Commission to uh, end passenger rail service. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, that was how mail was delivered to most uh, communities, and uh, you would have uh, mail sacks even thrown off, trains wouldn't even uh, stop in a lot of cases, they would uh, keep rolling through communities and toss off a bag of mail, and uh, sometimes they would pick up mail on a hook. In this case, uh, there was enough uh, being uh, picked up at the uh, railroad. There was a railway uh, postal uh, service area on every train, and they would sort uh, packages uh, on the go. Uh, so it was with the uh, loss of that mail contract that a lot of... Uh, Railroad stopped uh, offering passenger service, and within a few years you had uh, Amtrak created to continue operating. But uh, with the end of uh, passenger rail service, this is a great photo. There's a historian I worked with uh, for this book named Bill Pollard. He's a dentist in Conway, and uh, he has been photographing uh, trains for decades. Uh, he was uh, fairly young when this uh, photo was taken, but he went out there to catch the last westbound train going by the Little Rock train station. Uh, it was uh, late at night, uh, around midnight, uh, but he had been experimenting with. He took this with a tripod, not a flash, uh, but uh, using a tripod and sh uh, slow shutter speed. You can see the one uh, crew member is actually kind of a blur because He's moving. But uh, Bill Pollard, that's actually his uh, kid brother there in the middle. Uh, 
uh, and uh, he was able to get the inbound and outbound train crews to uh, pose for a photo for that uh, last train coming through. But with the end of uh, passenger service on the Rock Island, he then had the railroad focusing on freight service. And I was talking just before I uh, came in here with uh, a woman who talked to me about how she actually would bike down to uh, Round Biddle and uh, would see the Roundhouse. This is actually right by the uh, Roundhouse, uh, the turntable where they would uh, turn locomotives, and uh, that's uh, an employee there on the ground helping uh, guide the uh, uh, locomotive and the engineer off the turntable. But just uh, one of many uh, amazing photos that uh, I was able to get. This photo was taken by a photographer named Clifton Hull, and he took a lot of great photos uh, around Arkansas. Uh, they have a lot of his photos at the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. That was one of the entities I worked with in uh, collecting photos for the book. My book, uh, it is primarily a collection of photos. Uh, Arcadia Publishing produces very localized histories uh, of communities as well as a series all about railroads. But uh, a tough time for railroads. There were really rather outdated uh, regulations at that time. And uh, as you had the interstate system being built, you had a lot more freight being moved by uh, trucks. Uh, and uh, railroads started merging. The Rock Island, to uh, continue surviving, uh, was looking for a merger partner and ended up talking with the uh, Union Pacific. At that time, the Union Pacific was not in Arkansas. The Missouri Pacific that operated through here, it was a separate railroad. And uh, they had talked about uh, merging. They uh, proposed a merger in 1964, and it began what's said to be the uh, longest, most complicated merger case to ever go before the Interstate Commerce Commission. You had a lot of uh, opposition from other railroads, and when this uh, merger was first proposed, the Rock Island uh, stopped doing a lot of infrastructure. Uh, its tracks deteriorated a lot. And, uh, and by the way, there's the sound of a train <laughs> passing right here. Uh, but the, the Rock Island, uh, it was in a tough situation financially, and uh, it uh, kept expecting that Union Pacific, this bigger railroad, was going to uh, take over. And uh, it, the equipment uh, went down, the track quality went down. When you don't have a track, then it's uh, hard to maintain a railroad. So they were running trains much slower, and it, it was just a, a real difficult time for the uh, railroad, and this just kind of epitomizes it. This was uh, taken in 1972. The depot by this time had uh, been abandoned. Uh, Rock Island had merged all of its operations at Biddle Yard, which is, uh, it's still uh, over there. The Union Pacific still operates it. It's not a major rail yard anymore like it once was. Uh, now it's little more than a staging area for moving trains over to uh, its main yard over in North Little Rock. Uh, but the depot was no longer in use and uh, soon it would be boarded up. Key in this building's survival uh, really was a guy named uh, Hugh Patterson. He was owner of the Arkansas Gazette and uh, he bought uh, the ground that uh, this uh, depot sat on, as well as uh, several other acres around it. And uh, he put the uh, Arkansas Gazette's main printing plant over there. And it's still there. It's still the main uh, printing press for the uh, Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Uh, but I've heard he had more than a basic interest in railroads, and he gets a lot of credit for the fact that this depot is still there because he had it uh, boarded up and he had the uh, you know, security people over there at the Arkansas Gazette Press kind of keep an eye on it. Uh, so we're very fortunate in that respect. Uh, the depot building itself, uh, when I first started going out there when I was in high school and started uh, researching the Rock Island and I was curious what the area was like. At that time, 
the Rock Island had been gone eight years. This was 1988. And uh, the building was boarded up. The track was taken up. The uh, Arkansas River Bridge, which uh, you can see here, which is right by it, uh, at that time it was uh, abandoned. Uh, I wrote to uh, Union Pacific at that time when I was uh, researching my paper and uh, inquired about uh, trackage they had acquired in Arkansas and asked uh, about this bridge. And uh, at that time they wrote me back and they said, well, the bridge is going to be taken down. We have two other bridges that cross the Arkansas River here. We don't use it. It's nothing more than a liability for us sitting out there in the middle of the river. You know, you had uh, the McClellan Kerr River Navigation Project happened in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, and that's when you had uh, lift spans added uh, to the uh, railroad bridges. They were going to take down the, uh, uh, the three fixed spans of the Arkansas River Bridge, and they were going to take the uh, lift span, which was added in the 1970s. They were going to move it over to a bridge in Washington State. And uh, it's a little bit of luck that that didn't happen, but another image of the bridge. You, you all probably know that this is now the uh, pedestrian and uh, bicycle bridge over there by the Clinton Presidential Library. This was the uh, northern approach, looking at it uh, from North Little Rock. Uh, a few photos, uh, until I started uh, researching this project, uh, I, I had seen trains on the bridge as a kid. Uh, that's what I liked about the Arkansas River Bridge. When I was a kid, it was still in use, and it seemed to be in use more heavily than the uh, other bridge on the other side of the I-30 bridge, which was the Junction Bridge, part of the Missouri Pacific's Louisiana division. But I liked the Rock Island Bridge in that it was uh, typically in the down position. Uh, the lift span you see, uh, it actually hasn't been lowered. We figured out it's been 1984 since that lift span was actually brought back down. That's when the Arkansas River Bridge stopped being used by rail traffic, uh, and uh, it's been locked in the uh, up position since then. Uh, tracks were taken out during the 1980s, and uh, the, it was just expected that it was going to be eventually removed. Uh, the, uh, when the renovation happened, it became the uh, Clinton Presidential Park Bridge. Uh, you may know that there was... Uh, it was made so that there are ramps inside there. This bridge is actually can't, they've removed all the uh, electrical, you know, what lowered and raised the bridge and the weights, and it's uh, now forever going to be in the up position. But this is, uh, I made a point to really seek out bridge, uh, photos of the bridge in the down position. Uh, this, after, this is when the railroad was really uh, in its final days. Uh, after the, uh, I mentioned that the Rock Island stopped maintaining its track, and after this uh, very extensive 11-year process of trying to get approval uh, to merge with Union Pacific, once the uh, federal government did approve the merger, the uh, track, the infrastructure for the Rock Island was in such bad shape that the Union Pacific decided it would cost too much money to uh, fix it. And uh, it actually walked away from the deal and left the Rock Island uh, uh, essentially hanging. Almost uh, immediately, the Rock Island filed for bankruptcy protection in 1975. Uh, it attempted a reorganization. It continued to operate for another five years. But this photo was uh, taken in 1976. And uh, you can see the track's not in good condition. You had slow orders where trains couldn't travel more than uh, 10 miles per hour. And uh, it was just a rough time uh, all the way around. And uh, there was one creditor for the railroad, well, probably several, but one creditor uh, who owned a lot of stock in the Rock Island who uh, felt it was worth more dead than alive and uh, after the, uh, uh, they attempted the reorganization, they uh, rebranded everything as The Rock. They felt they needed a new logo 
for the railroad, and uh, they they made a, a valiant effort to try to reorganize, to focus on core lines that could be profitable. But uh, this one uh, creditor in particular, a guy named Henry Crown, uh, wanted it liquidated. There was a strike in 1979. The uh, government ordered uh, another railroad, uh, the Kansas City Terminal, which was a consortium of railroads to take over and continue operating. But uh, he made the case that this strike uh, for employees who were owed back wages and other issues, it just showed that this railroad couldn't operate. There was uh, an argument in the country that uh, there were too many railroads operating in general. You had a lot of communities served by railroads, and there was the thought, we really need to consolidate. We need to kind of pare this uh, down a little bit. And there were some who believed uh, the country and the rail infrastructure in general would be better off uh, without this railroad. And uh, this is a photo I got from the uh, Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Uh, the caption for this said a final switch. This was uh, March 23rd, 1980. Uh, a federal judge finally went along with the uh, request that the railroad be shut down. Uh, the judge agreed and ordered uh, people to start preparing for the shutdown in January of 1980. And this was uh, two months later uh, preparing uh, to uh, shut it down. This was uh, one of the final trains that would actually be operated by the Rock Island. Getting back to uh, me at that point, I'm uh, about eight years old and I'm going to Redwood Elementary over in North Little Rock and I see the railroad uh, shut down and it uh, just really uh, struck a nerve with me and uh, that's just where uh, I started uh, following the railroad. After it shut down, there were a few stretches in the state that continued to be served, uh, but for the most part, most of the tracks ended up being taken up. Uh, over in uh, North Little Rock, this is just a couple of blocks away from uh, where I went to school. Uh, this is the uh, North Little Rock train station. It had been abandoned since, uh, rail sir since passenger service ended in uh, 1967 and at this point was uh, obviously in rough shape. This was, uh, again, 1981, uh, another great photo I was able to get originally an Arkansas Gazette photo. Uh, there's a fascinating political history, then a big uh, fight about the future of rail service in the state. You had a lot of communities that depended on service from the Rock Island, and uh, as part of my research, uh, I was able to access the uh, files of uh, Governor Bill Clinton from his first term in office between 1978 and 1980. And uh, they kept uh, an extensive uh, collection of papers from that time because this was considered a major crisis. You had 700 people in Arkansas who worked for the Rock Island. There were a lot of communities that were only served by the uh, railroad. And uh, it started a lot of discussion after the railroad shut down. There was talk about maybe Arkansas purchasing the tracks and then leasing it out to other railroads. Uh, some states did that. Oklahoma, for instance, did that. Uh, Iowa did that. Uh, and uh, the, the Rock Island tracks, what were, uh, the tracks, uh, they're still in use today. Uh, in Arkansas, it ended up uh, coming down to the legislature to decide whether or not to uh, buy the tracks. I think it was 1984, and uh, it was uh, a fiercely debated topic. Uh, and uh, there was competition from the Missouri Pacific. Uh, there were a lot of lobbying efforts from Missouri Pacific as well as the Cotton Belt who didn't want these tracks to continue to be used, and uh, it was a narrow vote. Uh, ended up the legislature deciding, no, we shouldn't buy the tracks. And uh, shortly after that, this is uh, what happened in most of the country. Uh, this is uh, an area in uh, western Arkansas. Uh, 
you had some towns like Boonville, for instance. They had three major factories uh, along the railroad tracks that depended on the uh, Rock Island. And when the railroad shut down, uh, those industries ended up moving. And it's part of what they uh, uh, blame the decline that happened uh, in Boonville on. Uh, you had the tracks taken up and uh, pretty much sold for scrap for the uh, steel rails. Uh, there are a few exceptions uh, the, uh, from Little Rock to uh, uh, Danville. It's run by a company called the uh, Little Rock and Western. Uh, it was a short line that was created. Initially, there was a paper mill in Perry uh, that uh, depended on rail service. Perry is uh, right next door to Perryville in uh, Perry County, uh, but there was a paper mill that if it was going to continue operating, it needed continued rail service. So they uh, leased some equipment, hired a few former Rock Island employees, and kept trains running, and they found out that there was enough business that they uh, could actually become a profitable short-line railroad. So it ended up being acquired by another company that uh, owned uh, about a dozen uh, short-line railroads across the country. And uh, I'll tell a little more about that, but the other stretch of track primarily still in use was between Brinkley and Memphis. That uh, stretch of track had been shared with the Cotton Belt Railroad for many years, and uh, that was continued to be used, but for the most part, you had the uh, tracks taken up. This is uh, what the bridge looked like when I was in high school. As I said, I had uh, written to Union Pacific, which owned the Rock Island Bridge, and when they told me that the bridge was going to be uh, dismantled, it was a little stupid on my part, but I, I actually, I was fearless at the time. I started uh, trespassing and climbing all over the uh, Rock Island Bridge. You can see uh, the tracks taken up. You can see board, that's the walkway on the left. And you can see big gaping holes. Uh, there once was a steel uh, cable that, uh, you know, you could use if you're walking out on it. But that's gone and... Uh, in hindsight, uh, really, and I even used to climb up the, their towers, internal uh, ladders within the towers of the lift span. What's uh, blocking the path there, that's the uh, counterweight whenever the bridge was in the up position. But I would climb up within the towers and I walked all over uh, that bridge because I wanted to uh, document it before it was gone. Uh, Thankfully, in the uh, 1990s, uh, there was an effort uh, by the mayors, uh, Little Rock Mayor uh, Jim Daly, uh, North Little Rock's Pat Hayes, and Pulaski County Judge Buddy Valines didn't want the railroad to tear it down. They uh, stalled for a few years, and uh, there was also a proposal in uh, 1995 to uh, create uh, uh, this area, what's today the river market. That time the whole area was pretty much uh, abandoned warehouses for the most part. It was uh, largely, uh, you know, in fact, the area around the uh, depot and the bridge at that time was essentially a large homeless camp. And uh, thankfully the uh, mayors and the county judge were able to uh, keep uh, the railroad from tearing it down, and uh, it was uh, whenever after Bill Clinton left office, when he was deciding where to uh, put his uh, library, he ended up deciding to build it along the Arkansas River. Again, it was a largely unused area, and uh, Bill Clinton wasn't, you know, able to do anything to save the Rock Island or its trackage, but it's ironic he ended up uh, memorializing, you know, two key parts of the Rock Island in the state, the Arkansas River Bridge and uh, what was the uh, Little Rock train station. If you notice, it says on it the uh, Choctaw route uh, there at the uh, top of the depot. That's a throwback to when the depot was built by the Choctaw, Oklahoma, and Gulf Railroad. The depot had been uh, uh, preserved. Uh, there was a restaurant there for a few years. After sitting abandoned for a couple of decades, uh, a, comp a, rail uh, a restaurant called Spaghetti Warehouse spent millions of dollars to renovate it, and uh, they get a lot of credit then for 
helping to preserve it. And then whenever uh, Clinton decided to put his presidential library there, uh, they used this now as the uh, Clinton School of Public Service to actually be converted into a uh, uh, pedestrian and bicycle bridge. Uh, they hope to have it done when the uh, Clinton Library opened. Uh, I forget what year that was. It was while I was maybe two, maybe 2004, I think. Uh, but the cost of steel and other things ended up uh, making it much more expensive to renovate the bridge. When I first moved back here, after uh, being away for about uh, 13 years doing news elsewhere in the country, the bridge, it was, you know, property of the uh, Clinton Library, or at least had been set aside for that. But it wasn't until uh, 2011 that they were able to finally uh, go in, do the work, build the ramps. And uh, this was a photo I took when I covered the dedication ceremony for the bridge. Uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, I've interviewed a few people over the years about uh, the railroad. Uh, and it was largely just to document their stories. Um, but when I was, uh, I had a section on my website where I posted audio a lot of a lot of these interviews I had recorded, and uh, the publisher of the book I eventually put out uh, reached. They came across that and said, "You know, would you be interested in putting together a book?" And uh, so that's when I actually, for the first time, started uh, going around and working to collect photos for this book. And I really wanted it to be. You know, there are a lot of railroad people who just take photos of uh, the equipment. Uh, but there are, uh, I, I'd seen uh, books, there's a, a great photographer, O. Winston Link, who took a lot of photos of the uh, Norfolk and Western Railroad. They're, uh, they're, they're black and white photos. They were one of the last railroads to uh, uh, use steam in the US and he has like an iconic photo of a steam train, it's black and white steam train going by a uh, drive-in uh, movie theater. And uh, I, I, you know, I loved his work and so I really wanted to try to get as many photos as I could to, you know, include the people of the Rock Island in Arkansas. And this was one of my favorites. Uh, this was uh, uh, DJ Lamb. He was the uh, longtime Leola station agent and this was taken by uh, Clifton Hall, who just took uh, so many great photos. But uh, I mentioned it's been 38 years since the railroad shut down, but uh, these people are still a family. They still get together. Uh, there's a core group of them who meet every other month uh, at a Golden Corral and just to keep up with one another. But once a year, they have a picnic over at uh, uh, Sherwood Forest, uh, over in uh, Sherwood, and uh, this was uh, from last year. Their numbers are dwindling quickly. Again, it's been 38 years since the railroad shut down. These are mainly the ones who uh, were fairly young at the time when the railroad uh, shut down, but they still get together. The Rock Island, I've heard from so many, really was much more like a, a family because it was a, a smaller operation, and... Uh, a key thing, uh, I, I've been working on a podcast series, uh, an effort to preserve a depot in Perry has uh, kept me from producing as much as I'd like, but I mentioned I've interviewed about uh, 30 employees and uh, I've structured and I, I've put together the first uh, episode of the podcast, which uh, largely focuses on how they still get together. A key Part of every one of their annual reunions is they uh, do a roll call of everyone who has died since the uh, previous year's gathering. And uh, it, it, it's just very moving to be there. I've been to the last uh, three annual picnics. Uh, I spoke yesterday with the uh, uh, gentleman there at the microphone who is the uh, head of the uh, group, the president of the Arkansas group, and uh, he told me the next meeting's going to be next month, so I plan to go there again to uh, see if I can get a few more interviews. Finally, though, I'll tell you about this project that I've gotten involved in. There's uh, this depot in Perry, a 100-year-old depot that uh, was used by the Rock Island. 
I mentioned the short line that was created, the Little Rock and Western, by this paper mill that needed to uh, continue service. Uh, well, this stretch of track is still in use. This depot is still in use, but last year the head of uh, Preserve Arkansas, Rachel Hendricks, uh, she was going to speak to the Perry County Historical and Genealogical Society. She had to cancel, contacted me and asked if I'd go speak. And uh, that's when I met uh, Buford and Linda Suffrage, who are here tonight. Y'all want to wave? <laughs> they are with the uh, Perry County Historical and Genealogical Society. We learned that uh, the Little Rock and Western wanted to tear down this depot. Uh, it was never abandoned. It's uh, the last wood frame depot in Arkansas of the Rock Islands still left. And for the last 13 months, Buford and I have been uh, working to preserve it. Uh, part of the problem, it's a short line railroad. The local general manager has been great, but it's now owned, this short line, by a corporation that owns about 200 short line railroads around the world. And uh, they don't have any special love for history or preservation. Uh, and they, uh, but thankfully the local people have done what they can to help, but it's been a, a huge challenge to get approval. What we want to do is to move this depot. Uh, the city of Perry has uh, uh, given us a lot, about 150 feet away from where the depot is now. It's uh, still along railroad tracks. There are a lot of people I've spoken with uh, about the proper way to go about moving this depot in a way so that it would still be eligible for nomination to the National Registers of Historic Places. One thing, if we can keep its uh, integrity still being along railroad tracks, that would be key. This was uh, in January of 1980, just before the Rock Island shut down. I mentioned it was uh, rebranded as the Rock. That was part of their uh, uh, reorganization effort. They thought they needed a new, more modern image. And this was the uh, Perry Switcher, which served the uh, paper mill uh, there in Perry. But uh, after the Rock Island was shut down and uh, that stretch of track ended up having enough industry to uh, support uh, the railroad, uh, they ended up building a locomotive servicing facility behind the Perry Depot. And uh, in its first four years, uh, it was, uh, the depot was used uh, as the headquarters for the railroad. Once they uh, began, uh, once it became a full-fledged short-line railroad, they built a different office building nearby. But uh, this is in March of this year. It may look a, a little ratty, the roof, you know, looks like it's uh, uh, struggling a little bit, but it's actually in uh, pretty good shape from everything I've heard. One of the reasons why this is significant, I mean, there are a lot of reasons to me, but it was, uh, you know, the center of the community. I sometimes try to convey the importance railroad depots had in communities. It was the connection to the outside world. I mentioned uh, mail. It's not only where mail would come in, but it's also where uh, people would obviously leave on trips. But during the wars, uh, World War I, World War II, this is uh, where people would depart, military trains. This is where they'd uh, see their relatives as they departed. For those who uh, died in combat, this is where the uh, bodies would come to be claimed. If they did make it back, this is where they had their reunions with their loved ones. It was part of a major transportation vein. Probably millions, that's a safe guess, millions of people passed this spot. But there's uh, one thing which is unique to railroads. Uh, inside the freight area, and this is uh, a lot in the case in a lot of uh, depots, uh, people who worked in there, you know, the freight area was where only railroad employees uh, worked. Uh, they, there are actually many, many names engraved in there. This is uh, one person. 
We think that uh, the depot was built in uh, 1918 from everything we found, but we think the uh, date, uh, January 1st, 1910, was probably the seniority date for this employee. Seniority dates were your, uh, the dates when you were hired, and that basically, that seniority, that's uh, by how long you worked for the railroad, uh, depended on, uh, you know, if, if there were layoffs, and it would be the more recently hired people. There are several uh, very clear dates like this. There are a lot of just inscribed, you know, with keys, but this is one of the most uh, dramatic names in there. Uh, he is actually uh, buried there in uh, uh, Perry Two in the cemetery. Uh, you can find his, uh, his uh, stone uh, there. It's also, uh, there were two waiting rooms uh, abiding by Jim Crow laws of the day. Uh, you had a white waiting room and you had the colored waiting room. And this is the uh, ticket counter inside the uh, uh, white waiting room. Uh, in recent years, the last several decades since uh, uh, the Short Line Railroad built another office building, this has just been used for uh, storage. Uh, and I was able to go through it, but this is the uh, ground where we're looking to uh, move the depot to. This was uh, taken uh, Saturday. I went out there. Uh, Perry has done a lot of work. Uh, the mayor has worked to uh, get the ground built up. They've put several layers of shale on the ground. They've had uh, heavy equipment that has repeatedly been flattening the ground. And uh, it's uh, looking like uh, this is going to happen. Uh, and uh, Buford, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, do you want to come up and talk about the plans for uh, the depot and what y'all would like to do with it? Uh, Buford suffrage with the uh, Perry County Historical and Genealogical Society. Well, uh, let me just say first, I can't take much credit for all of this. Without this guy here, this would have never happened. And I think you got word today that it's yeah. uh, the uh, Combs House Movers uh, now has permission to uh, go ahead and move the depot. Yeah, and, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's taken literally 13 months of uh, talking yeah. with the railroad to get approval, largely just for the uh, house mover to even get access to the property. Uh, the house mover, God bless him. The stuff he has <laughs> gone through. He ha th this Sunday, he, he has gotten, again, he's a house mover. Uh, but we have had to get up to uh, $5 million in uh, insurance coverage, which is standard for the railroad. Uh, the house mover, he has up to $2 million in insurance coverage. And that's enough for him to move houses, get them out on highways, uh, we've, we've had to spend about $6,000 uh, on insurance coverage. The estimate to move the depot is seven to $8,000. we have been uh, fundraising for this. I think uh, we're up to now almost $9,000. Mm -hmm. We've gotten uh, some good donations from a lot of people. It's <laughs> also been uh, uh, just grassroots fundraising. It's been people interested in history, people in the railroad, uh, business, former employees, but... Uh, it's now actually looking like it's going to happen. The corporate uh, parent company of the short line has uh, finally approved everything. So, uh, but talk a little bit about what you'd like to see happen with this. Well, there's a, there's a, a terrible amount of interest in this in Perry County. And you have to understand that uh, up until 1947 or 48, uh, Highway 10 or Cantrell Road, uh, the paving ended at the ranch uh, where Bank of the Ozarks or whatever they're calling themselves now is building that big building. Uh, there's a, if you're familiar with the air, area uh, where Wendy's is, that's where the paving ended. And uh, so it was a dirt road when I was a kid all the way to Perryville. And uh, although Perryville was three miles away, uh, this is where the mail came in for Perryville. We got two deliveries a day. And it was, uh, as Michael said previously, it was contact with the outside world. And uh, I was five years old when World War II ended, but I can remember seeing soldiers at the 
Perry Depot when we would uh, when we would go to Marlton, and uh, so there was a lot of activity there, and so there's a lot of interest in uh, saving the depot, and Perry has some experience in this because the old Perry High School gym uh, was uh, bought by actually bought by Woodman of the World from uh, the Perry Casa Ola. Plainview School District, which is now called Two Rivers, and they sold that gym and they totally restored it. And it's restored original colors and everything. Beautiful. If you ever buy there, you should stop and see it. If you're uh, there's a bunch of old men that play basketball there every Monday night, so if you're interested in that, you can stop at five and play basketball. Cost you two dollars. You have to pay. If you play, you pay. They have a sign. If you pay, if you play, you pay. But uh, so there's a lot of interest in it, and the idea is to uh, get it moved and get it fully restored, and then uh, have a railroad museum there, and uh, perhaps uh, have it open uh, a few times a month. And the, uh, the Perry County Historical and Genealogical Society. We're, we're not a large organization. And, but somebody had to, there had to be a name connected with it in order to save the depot, so that's where we came in. And so if any of you have any money you'd like to donate, <laughs> uh, we'd be glad to accept it. And you make your check out, though, to the Perry County Historical Museum. And the reason for that is it's a 501C, whereas the Historical Society is not, and that makes your donation fully deductible then. But uh, at any rate, uh, like I said, I have to give a ton of credit to this guy here. Why? Just real quickly, uh, he, he set up a GoFundMe, and he put out the word one time we needed $2,050, I believe it was, and by golly, somebody donated $2,050. <laughs> this was for the insurance, so. Well, it's 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 exciting. So it's uh, yeah. I never intended, I never expected to be involved in anything like this. But it's uh, it's just sometimes you start something like this and you learn of a piece of land like this. And uh, what's unique about the depot? And one final photo here is yeah. You know, it it was never abandoned. That's a good thing. It's still been in use in some form. It's still got the old uh, semaphore. Uh, signals. Those are the ones where you have the blade that uh, comes down. And uh, there's just a lot that's still uh, very original uh, about the building. And I think it will be, we've got a lot of uh, great restored depots in this state. Uh, and I, it, it, I think there's certainly room for another one. Uh, but they, they just tell the uh, history of the community. And uh, it, it, another important, I mean, this is Western Union. This was where the Western Union uh, office was. So this is where, yeah, I tell people it's almost like the internet of the year. I mean, that was like, you know, back in the day when, uh, you know, telegrams were coming in. Uh, uh, but one final surprise, and I took this uh, on Saturday. Uh, I didn't intend to, they, I took, you know, several photos of the locomotives, and they have a locomotive servicing shed behind there. The reason uh, we ha are having to move the depot is the uh, short line that owns it now, they're wanting to, there's the shed behind it is where they service the locomotives. They're wanting to uh, build a new uh, locomotive servicing facility and uh, so, and they, they view the uh, depot as being a useless old building. I mean, they're, they're business, they're a corporation, they're not in the business of being a museum or anything. Uh, and uh, they want to build a larger uh, facility there. Uh, and I won't badmouth them too much. They've been difficult to work with, but at the same time, we were originally given a deadline of the end of 2017, and we clearly didn't meet that. But uh, the local general manager saw the, uh, the campaign we were starting. Uh, I kind of served as the liaison between the railroad uh, and the house mover, 
a uh, gentleman with the uh, Arkansas Railroad Club, uh, had recommended this house mover who gave us a reasonable estimate. Uh, we're expecting seven to $8,000 to move the depot. We had to spend about 6200 for insurance. But uh, the previous house mover we'd reached out to said something more in the range of eighteen to 22000 uh, So a lot of people to do this. Uh, but uh, one thing I was going to say about the uh, locomotive, I didn't even know when I took this photo that this was the case. Uh, but people track uh, locomotives by numbers. And uh, uh, this uh, locomotive was actually originally uh, a Rock Island locomotive that was built in uh, 1970. And uh, from there, it was sold to Missouri Pacific after the Rock Island shut down. Then Union Pacific acquired it. Then it uh, went to the Missouri and North Arkansas Railroad. And you can faintly see uh, through the paint job, the previously, it said the White River route. Uh, and then it ended up going to uh, uh, Kayamichi Railroad, which is one of the short lines owned by the uh, Genesee in Wyoming, the parent company that owns the current uh, short line, and that's how they've ended up with this uh, locomotive being back there. But uh, that ended up being a, a, a good sign. And uh, Anyway, so that's the, the whole story. Uh, we, one final note on the depot, uh, we, uh, the paper mill that's credited with uh, starting uh, or keeping this stretch of track in use. Uh, they uh, have invited us to go over there uh, September 10th, I think, and they're going to give us a donation, and we're hoping uh, that'll be a sizable donation that can maybe help, uh, you know, make this happen. So it's just, it's been incredible to get the interest uh, of people. So many people have just come out of the woodwork interested for one reason or another in this. And it's just been a fascinating project. But again, it all started with, uh, you know, my interest in it and the book. And it, it all ended up in things I never expected to happen. So, but I've been, uh, I've been talking longer than uh, I was intended. So, uh, I'll wrap it up uh, with that. But thank you all for listening, for inviting me to uh, come speak.